Doll Bones by Holly Black, a First Chapter Friday read aloud video with The Word Nerd. Today, as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. Last week, I read to you The Wild Robot by Peter Brown, and we talked specifically about how Peter included illustrations in this book and a little bit about his process. So I wanted to follow up this week with another illustrated novel, this time Doll Bones by Holly Black with illustrations and cover art by artist Eliza Wheeler. Now, a couple of interesting things about this process. Number one, did you know that books have been having illustrations with them since 900 AD. In fact, the Japanese were the first people to put illustrations with their stories when they illustrated scrolls. You can see that picture here, which is super cool. So this isn't anything new, but something that I did not know about this process is that the artist and the author hardly get the opportunity to talk at all. Initially, I was like, well, of course they talked about it, and they would say what they thought the character looked like and uh, what hopes and dreams they had for the, the visual representation of their story. But in fact, oftentimes, do they, they don't even talk, they don't even meet. And I know this for a fact because I've been able to meet both Holly Black and Eliza Wheeler. And I asked Eliza, like, how was it working with Holly? Like, that's amazing. She's like, I don't, I don't know. Like, we've never met, we've never talked. It's just pure craziness to me, but that's the way it works. Oftentimes the book editor and the artist, uh, the art director um, communicate back and forth, but the actual author and actual artist hardly ever get a chance to talk at all. One artist uh, put it this way, our job as the illustrator is to weave a connected visual narrative through your story. It may turn out differently to what the author imagined, but that's okay. That's wonderful, in fact. An illustrated book is a partnership between two creative minds, not just a decoration of the words. Lorena Carrington. And I'll put the link to her blog post describing this process below. So uh, we are going to jump right into the book, but um, I will pop up some of the illustrations as I read. And I just thought that was super interesting. And as a word nerd, I love finding out all these behind the scenes facts of the stories. And I hope you do too. One other thing before we get started real fast, um, Eliza Wheeler's incredible. Um, I love all of her work, but uh, this story we're going to read today is pretty creepy. Um, and another great fall Halloween-ish creepy book that she has illustrated is called The Pomegranate Witch. It's incredible. Uh, I'll put a link for this book um, and also my other fall favorite picture books down in the description box for you. But for right now, let's get into Doll Bones by Holly Black. Zach, Poppy, and Alice have been friends forever and for almost as long. They've been playing one continuous, ever-changing game. A game that takes place in a world populated with pirates and thieves, mermaids and warriors. Ruling over them all is the Great Queen, a bone china doll imprisoned in a cabinet, cursing those who displease her. But the three friends are in middle school now, and Zack's father is pushing him to give up make-believe for basketball. When his father gives him no choice, Zack quits the game and lies about the reason. It seems like their friendship might be over until Poppy declares she's been having dreams about the Queen and the ghost of a girl who will not rest until the bone china doll is buried in her empty grave. And so Zack and Alice and Poppy set off on one last adventure to lay the queen's ghost to rest. But nothing goes according to plan, and as their adventure turns into an epic journey, creepy things begin to happen. Is the doll just a doll, or is there something more sinister at work? Has Poppy been telling the truth, or is she tricking them into playing a new game? And if there really is a ghost... Will it, get them go, will it let them go now that it has them in their clutches? Uh, this book was the Newbery Honor winner in 2014. Um, and I can tell you, I personally don't really enjoy scary stories, but I can tell you this one is just creepy enough not to give you nightmares, but to keep you on the edge of your seat with uh, suspense and tension. So let's read chapter one of Doll Bones by Holly Black. Poppy set down one of the mermaid dolls close to the stretch of asphalt road that represented the blackest sea. They were old, bought from goodwill with big shiny heads, different colored tails, and frizzy hair. Zachary Barlow could almost imagine their fins lashing back and forth as they waited for the boat to get closer, their silly plastic smiles hiding their lethal intentions. 
They'd crash the ship against the shallows if they could, lure the crew into the sea, and eat the pirates with their jagged teeth. Zachary rummaged through his bag of action figures. He pulled out the pirate with the two cutlasses and placed him gently at the center of the boat-shaped paper they'd weighted down with, dish, dr with driveway gravel. Without gravel, the Neptune's pearl was likely to blow away with the early autumn wind. He could almost believe he wasn't on a scrubby lawn in front of Poppy's ramshackle house with the sagging siding, but aboard a real ship with saltwater spray stinging his face on his way to adventure. We're going to have to lash ourselves to the mast, Zack said, as William the Blade, captain of the Neptune's Pearl. Zack had a different way of speaking for each of his figures. He wasn't sure that anyone but him could tell his voices apart, but he felt different when he talked in them. Alice's braid spilled in front of her amber eyes as she moved a G.I. Joe Lady J figure closer to the center of the boat. Lady J was a thief who'd begun traveling with William the Blade after she'd been unsuccessful in picking his pocket. She was loud and wild, almost nothing like Alice, who chafed under the thumb of her overprotective grandmother, but did it quietly. "'You think the Duke's guards will be waiting for us in Silverfall?' Alice made Lady J ask. "'He might catch us,' said Zack, grinning at her. "'But he'll never hold us. Nothing will. "'We're on a mission for the Great Queen, and we won't be stopped.' He hadn't expected to say those words until they came out of his mouth, but they felt right. They felt like William's true thoughts. That was why Zack loved playing, those moments where it seemed like he was accessing some other world, one that felt real as anything. It was something he never wanted to give up. He'd rather go on playing like this forever, no matter how old they got, although he didn't see how that was possible. It was already hard sometimes. Poppy tucked windblown strands of red hair behind her ears and regarded Zack and Alice very seriously. She was tiny and fierce with freckles thick enough to remind Zack of the stars at night. She liked nothing better than being in charge of the story and had a sense of how to make the moment dramatic. That was why she was the best at playing villains. You can knot ropes to keep you safe, but no boat can pass through these waters unless a sacrifice is given to the deep, Poppy made one of the mermaids say. Willingly? or unwillingly. If one of your crew doesn't leap into the sea, the sea will choose her own sacrifice. That's the mermaid's curse. Alice and Zack exchanged a look. Were the mermaids telling the truth? Really, Poppy wasn't supposed to make up rules like that, ones that no one else had agreed to, but Zack objected only when he didn't like them. A curse seemed like it could be fun. We'll all go down together before we lose a single member of this crew, he fake shouted in William's voice. We're on a mission for the Great Queen, and we fear her curse more than yours. <clears throat> but just then, said Poppy ominously, moving one of the mermaids to the edge of the ship. <clears throat> Webbed fingers grabbed Lady J's ankle, and the mermaid pulls her over the side of the boat. She's gone. You can't do that, Alice said. I was lashed to the mast. You didn't specify that you were, Poppy told her. William suggested it, but you didn't say whether or not you did it. Alice groaned as though Poppy was being especially annoying, which she kind of was. While Lady J was in the middle of the boat, even if she wasn't lashed, a mermaid couldn't get to her without crawling on board. If Lady J gets pulled over the side, I'm going after her, Zack said, plunging William into the gravel water. I meant it when I said no one gets left behind. I didn't get pulled over the side, Alice insisted. As they continued arguing, two of Poppy's brothers walked out of the house, letting the screen door slam behind them. They looked over and started to snicker. The older of the two, Tom, pointed directly at Zack and said something under his breath. His younger brother laughed. Zack felt his face heat. He didn't think they knew anyone at his middle school, but still, if any of his teammates found out that at 12 he was still playing with action figures, basketball would become a lot less fun. School could get bad, too. Ignore them, declared Poppy loudly. They're jerks. All we were going to say is that Alice's grandmother called, Tom said, his face a parody of a hangdog innocence. He and Nate had the same tomato red hair as their sister, but they weren't much like her in any other way that Zack could see. They, along with their eldest sister, were always in trouble, fighting, cutting school, smoking, and other stuff. The Bell kids were considered hoodlums in town, and Poppy aside, they seemed intent on doing what they could to uphold that reputation. Old Lady Magne says you need to come home before dark, and for us to be sure to tell you not to forget or make excuses. She seems rough, Alice. The words were supposed to be nice, but you could tell from the sickly sweet way Tom talked that he wasn't being nice at all. 
Alice stood up and brushed off her skirt. The orange glow of the setting sun bronzed her skin and turned her glossy box braids metallic. Her eyes narrowed. Her expression wavered between flustered and angry. Boys had been hassling her ever since she'd hit ten, gotten curves, and started looking a lot older than she was. Zack hated the way Tom talked to her, like he was making fun of her without really saying anything bad, but he never knew what to say to stop them either. Leave off, Zack told them. The bell boys laughed. Tom mimicked Zack, making his voice high-pitched. Leave off, don't you talk to my girlfriend. Yeah, leave off, Nate squeaked, or I'll beat you up with my doll. Alice darted toward the bell house, head down. Great, Zack thought. As usual, he'd made it worse. Don't go yet, Poppy called to Alice, ignoring her brothers. Come home and just see if you can spend the night. Call home and just see if you can spend the night. I better not, Alice said. I've just got to get my backpack from inside. Wait up, Zack said, grabbing Lady J. He headed for the screen door and got there just as it shut his face. You forgot... The inside of Poppy's house was always a mess. Discarded clothes, half-empty cups, and sports equipment covered most surfaces. Her parents seemed to have given up on the house around the same time they gave up on trying to enforce any rules about dinners and bedtimes and fighting. Around Poppy's eighth birthday, when one of her brothers threw her cake with its still-lit birthday candles at her older sister. Now, there were no more birthday parties. There weren't even family meals, just boxes of macaroni and cheese and cans of ravioli and tins of sardines in the pantry so that the kids could feed themselves long before their parents came home from work and fell exhausted into their beds. Zack felt envious every time he thought of that kind of freedom, and Alice loved it even more than he did. She spent as many nights there as her grandmother allowed. Poppy's parents didn't seem to notice, which worked out pretty perfect. He opened the screen door and went inside. Alice was standing in front of the old, dusty, locked display cabinet in the corner of the Bell living room, peering at all the things Poppy's mother had forbidden Poppy, on pain of death and possible dismemberment, from touching. That was where the doll they called the Great Queen of all their kingdoms was trapped, next to a blown glass vase from Savers that had turned out to be vintage something or other. The Queen had been picked up by Poppy's mother at a tag sale, and she insisted that one day she was going to go on Antiques Roadshow to sell it and move them all to Tahiti. The Queen was a bone china doll of a child with gold straw curls and paper white skin. Her eyes were closed, lashes flaxen fringe against her cheek. She wore a long gown and the thin fabric dotted with some black that might be mold. Zack couldn't remember when exactly they'd decided that she was the Great Queen, only that they'd all felt like she was watching them, even though her eyes were closed, and that Poppy's sister had been terrified of her. Apparently, one time, Poppy had woken in the middle of the night and found her sister, with whom she shared a bedroom, sitting upright in bed. If she gets out of the case, she'll come for us, her sister had said blank face before slumping back down in her pillow. No amount of calling to the other side of the room had seemed to stir her. Poppy had tossed and turned, unable to sleep for the rest of the night, but in the morning her sister had told her that she didn't remember saying anything, that it must have been a nightmare, and that their mother really needed to get rid of that doll. After that, to, be, to avoid being totally terrified, Zack, Poppy, and Alice had added the doll to their game. According to the legend they'd created, the queen ruled over everything from her beautiful glass tower. She had the power to put her mark on anyone who disobeyed her commands. When that happened, nothing would go right for them until they regained her favor. They'd be convicted of crimes they didn't commit. Their friends and family would stricken and die. Ships would sink and storms would strike. The one thing the queen couldn't do, though, was escape. You okay? Zack asked Alice. She seemed transfixed by the case, staring into it as though she could see something Zack couldn't. Finally, Alice turned around, her eyes shining. My grandmother wants to know where I am every second. She wants to pick out my clothes for me and complains about my braids all the time, and I am just so over it. And I don't know if she's going to let me be in the play this year, even though I got a good part. She can't see so well after dark, and she doesn't want to drive me home. I'm just so tired of all her rules, and it's like the older I get, the worse she gets. Zach had heard most of that before, but usually Alice just sounded resigned to it. What about your aunts? Could you ask her to pick you up after rehearsals? Alice snorted. She's never forgiven Aunt Linda for trying to get custody of me way back when. Brings it up at every holiday. It's made her super paranoid. Mrs. Magne grew up in, Phil in the Philippines and was fond of telling anyone who would listen how different things were over there. 
According to her, Filipino teenagers worked hard, never talked back, and didn't draw on their hands with ink pens or want to be actresses like Alice did. They didn't get as tall as Alice was getting either. Made her super paranoid? Zach asked. Alice laughed. Yeah, okay, made her extra super paranoid. Hey! Poppy came into the living room from outside, holding the rest of their figures. Are you sure you can't stay over, Alice? Alice shook her head, plucked Lady J out of Zach's hand, and went down the hallway to Poppy's room. I was just getting my stuff. Poppy turned impatiently to Zach for an explanation. She never liked it when she wasn't part of a conversation and hated the idea that her friends had kept any secrets from her, even stupid ones. Her grandmother, he said with a shrug, you know. Poppy sighed and looked at the cabinet. After a moment, she spoke. If you finish this quest, the queen will probably lift the curse on William. He could go home and finally solve the mystery of where he came from. Or maybe she'll just make him do another quest. He thought about it a moment and grinned. Maybe she wants him to get skilled enough with a sword to break her out of that cabinet. Don't even think about it, Poppy said, only half joking. Come on. They walked down the hall to Poppy's room just as Alice came out, backpack over one shoulder. See you tomorrow, she said as she slipped past them. She didn't look happy, but Zach thought she might be just upset that she was leaving early and that they were going to be hanging out without her. He and Poppy didn't usually play the game when Alice wasn't there, but lately Alice seemed to be more bothered by he and Poppy spending time alone together, which he didn't understand. Zach walked into Poppy's room and flopped down on her orange shag rug. Poppy used to share a room with her older sister, and pile of her sister's outgrown clothes still remained spread out in drifts along with a collection of used makeup and notebooks covered in stickers and scrawled with lyrics. A jumble of her sister's old Barbies were on top of a bookshelf, waiting for Poppy to try and fix their melted arms and chopped hair. The bookshelves were overflowing with fantasy paperbacks and overdue library books, some of them on Greek myths, some on mermaids, and a few on local hauntings. The walls were covered in posters, Doctor Who, a cat in a bowler hat, and a giant map of Narnia. Zack thought about drawing a map of their kingdoms, one with the oceans and the islands and everything, and he wondered where he could get a piece of paper big enough. Do you think that William likes Lady J? Poppy asked, settling herself cross-legged on the bed, the pale pink of one knee visible through the rip in her hand-me-down jeans. Like, like likes? He sat up. What? William and Lady J, she said. They've been traveling together a while, right? I mean, he must like her some. Sure he likes her, Zack said, frowning. He pulled his beat-up army surplus duffel bag toward him and stuffed William inside. But I mean, like, would he marry her? Poppy asked. Zack hesitated. He was used to being asked how characters felt, and it was a simple question, but there was something in Poppy's voice that made him think there was a meaning behind it that was less simple. He's a pirate. Pirates don't get married, but I mean, if he wasn't a pirate and she wasn't a crazy kleptomaniacal thief, then I guess he might. Poppy sighed as though that was the worst answer ever given by anyone, but she dropped it. They talked about other things, like how Zach couldn't play the next day because of basketball practice, whether or not aliens would ever land, and if they did, whether they would be peaceful or not, they both thought not, and which of them would be more useful in a zombie uprising, a draw, since Zach's longer legs would be better for getting away and Poppy's small size was a hiding advantage. On the way out, Zach paused in the living room to look at the queen again. Her pale face was shadowed, but it seemed to him that though her eyes were closed, they weren't quite as closed as they had been before. While he stared at her, trying to figure out if he was imagining things, her lashes fluttered once, as if stirred by an impossible breeze, or as if she was a sleeper on the verge of awakening. If you want to find out what happens to these friends and uh, the queen in the case, continue reading Doll Bones by Holly Black, and I will see you next week for another First Chapter Friday. Happy reading! To continue reading Doll Bones by Holly Black and illustrated by Eliza Wheeler, check out a copy from your school library, local indie bookstore, or purchase it via the link in the description box below. Then make sure you check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I have tons of great middle grade and YA stories waiting for you, one for each week of the year. Today's mystery quote says, He liked the way the story unfolded as he wrote. Like the way the answers just came to him, like they were true things just waiting to be discovered. Don't forget to check out these fall favorite picture books. The link for the video is in the description box.
Please like this video and subscribe so you can stay connected for more great First Chapter Friday videos and other videos you can use in your classroom. Happy reading!